going to go on and do the motor examination of the lower limbs. Once again, I'm going to remind you that the upper motor neuron starts on the right motor cortex to um, Paddy's left leg, and it'll run from the motor cortex to the corona radiata, to the internal capsule, to the midbrain, pons, medulla, crossing over. The corticospinal tract, as it's now called, will run from the cortex to the spine, down throughout the spinal cord, down towards the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae where it synapses, and no longer be, is no longer the upper motor neuron the minute it synapses on the anterior horn cell. The anterior horn cell then represents the start of the lower motor neuron, so it will come out from the, the lower motor neuron comes out from the uh, anterior horn cell through the intervertebral foramina into the lumbosacral plexus, in this instance, down the leg into its neuromuscular junction. So a lesion from cortex to anterior horn cell, horn cell coming to the left leg will lead to upper motor neuron signs in the leg. Increased tone, clonus, increased reflexes, and an extensor or upgoing toe. Some people still call it a positive Babinski. A lower motor neuron will come from the anterior horn cell down. Signs will be wasting, fasciculations, loss of reflexes, down going toe, and loss of tone. So in approaching the patient, as always, you introduce yourself. Thanks very much, Paddy, for helping us. Now, what I'm going to do first, as before, when we're looking at muscles, is look for wasting of fasciculations. And as I said in the upper limb, I tend to just either flick the muscles all the way along, more to remind myself than anything else, not to forget to do so, looking for fasciculations. And I might step back a little bit to look for wasting at the thigh muscles, around the calves, and then around the feet. I look for the uh, shape as well, looking for pes calvus, which can be seen in hereditary sensory motor neuropathy and in um, uh, Friedrich's ataxia. Should look at the calves a little bit as well, which can be hypertrophic in some muscular disorders and pseudo-hypertrophic in some dystrophic disorders. So once I've established that there's nothing obvious on the initial inspection, I do a rough guide for tone. I ask the patient first, have you any pain in your legs that'll no. make things worse? No. Okay, so I'm going to move your legs very gently first. And that's just to establish that the legs do move and the tone is grossly okay. The next thing I'll do is a bit more aggressively, I'll pick the joint, the foot, the leg up at the knee and I'll flick it up quite gr briskly. So it should bend in a relaxed patient fairly easily. In a person who's got upper motor neuron signs of this leg, you might find it'll be a slower bend like that. I often pick up the leg and then take the ankle and give it a little bit of a turn as well to see if there's any resistance or increased tone there. If there isn't, I proceed to clonus, in which case you bend up the knee and make a right angle, if you can, at the knee and a right angle at the ankle like this. And gradually, if you can relax the patient, don't rush it, don't go too hard, and then you warn them, I'm going to give your leg a flick down a second, so don't get a fright. So a little flick like that. And if it's clonus, it'll go like that, and that'll be upper motor neuron signs, often seen in MS bilaterally with bilateral clonus. So it's normal tone here, but you're looking for increase or decreased tone of the leg. The next thing is to examine power. Power goes in all the muscle groups, each down, all the way down, of course, and uh, comparing like with like. Now, you can do this in a variety of ways, but a fairly rapid way and efficient way of doing it is to ask the patient to lift their right leg, I always say like a ballet dancer because people understand that, up straight off the bed, up as high as you can go, and don't let me push it down. And then I slip my hand in under here and say, now push it down against me. Right down, hard as you can. So then you've got hip flexion and extension done. Same again on this side, up in the air as high as you can, and you're thinking in MRC grades all the way along, push down, right down, and that's five over five bilaterally. Now you must break down your instructions often when you're doing power examinations, because otherwise you feel yourself under intense pressure, as does the patient. So can you bend up your right knee for me? Now I'm gonna test knee extension and flexion. So flexion first. Can you keep your knee bent? Don't let me straighten it. Okay, and now can you kick it out straight? Wonderful. Now you can bend up this knee, keep it bent. Don't let me straighten it. And now kick it out straight as you can. Wonderful. Okay, so then we come down further, and I say, can you cock up your feet right up on both sides? So dorsiflexion of the ankle, and keep it up as high as you can. And then obviously, you say, now push me down, plantar flexion. Push, point straight out that way. Okay, and cock up this one, and then point straight out that way. Like a ballet dancer again, great. So dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. A little bit more tricky to explain to a patient is eversion pointing out and inversion pointing in. I generally tend to say, can you keep your foot as still as you can and don't let me push it in? So in doing this, I'm testing eversion. He's pushing against me this way. And then if I say, keep your foot as straight as you can and don't let me push it out. And now he's testing inversion. He's pushing against me this way. 
So flexion, extension, flexion, extension, flexion, extension, inversion, eversion. So once we've done inspection, tone, and power, we now do the reflexes. The knee reflexes are fairly easy to do. I find that even at membership level, people still uh, get scared of them and start doing stupid things under the pressure of an examination. So for example, they just start tapping away in this way, or they'll spend about 20 minutes trying to find out where the patella tendon is. So it looks terrible, and you need to be much more professional, and the only way you can do that is by practice. But again, if you instruct clearly to the patient, they will cooperate with you. So I'm going to ask you to bend up your knee gently, just halfway. I'm going to hold it there, and you can let it rest in my hand. And simply put, you can see the tendon, but you're looking at the muscle group above. So you can see that there fairly clearly. If there's a doubt about it, can you put your hands like that for me? And when I say pull, I want you to pull, okay? This is Gendrasic's maneuver, which again primes the muscle spindles just temporarily. And there's no urgency with it. People tend to panic. So I'll say, one, two, three, pull. So the, you don't have to kind of coincide exactly. You can give it a second or so. Now we'll do the other knee. Can you bend up your knee, please? Just routinely. And you can see it's there, so I don't need to reinforce. Thank you. Now, the ankles are the ones that cause people problems. Can you bend up your knee? Now, flop your knee out towards me. Right angle, right angle. So I'm trying to get a right angle here at the Achilles tendon. I'm trying to hit here and watch this muscle contract. Okay? Now, I do it this way, and it's very easy, but I'm using a full swing of the tendon hammer. If I can't do it, I'll reinforce. Ready to go again with the uh, hands? On three. One, two, three, pull. And you can exaggerate a bit. Others do it this way, called a planter tap. And the old-fashioned way, really, is just to ask people to bring one leg over the other. Can you do that? And hold it there. So any of the ways are appropriate. I don't think there's any problem, with any, any problem doing it those ways. Whichever you prefer, whichever you're more comfortable with, and whichever you look best at doing, quite frankly. Can you bend up your knee? Flop it away from me. And again, I'm looking at right angle, right angle. I'm trying to make this muscle jump, if you'd like. And you can see that very clearly. I'm not crossing my hands. You're my examiners behind me, so you can see everything I'm doing, I hope. And that's part of it when it comes to exams as well. Now, you can rest your foot down. Uh, the final part of the motor examination is the Babinski response. Strictly speaking, I'd prefer if it was called the plantar response. So it can be either extensor, in which case it's an upper motor neuron lesion on that side. If it's bilateral extensor, then it's on both sides, obviously. Uh, but, or else it can be flexor, in which case the toe is going down. And in that case, it can be normal or it could be a lower motor neuron. The point about it is everyone does it um, in different ways, but there is only really one way that one should do it. So you stabilize the ankle and you apologize in advance to the patient that this is a little uncomfortable slash sore. Now, the, it's a nociceptive stimulus. Now, others disagree with me on this, but I'm, I, I'm, in clinical practice, it has to be slightly nociceptive. A lot of people have sensitive feet and say, oh, I can't bear it, I can't bear it. That's fine, but you still have to know the answer at some point. So you can go to the side and those that are very sensitive. But the proper way to do this is to start at the outer aspect, lateral aspect of the foot. And you're going to run, I'm not going to do it just yet, I'll warn you, this uh, stimulus up along the arch of the foot. And what I'm looking for, regardless of anything else, patient response, anything else, is the first movement of the big toe. Is it down or is it up? That's all I want to know. All this winging of toes and everything else, leave to one side. You either know or you don't know. So hopefully it will be clear when you've done the Babinski test that uh, whether the toe goes up or down. And I'm going to start now, a bit uncomfortable. And there it is. So the first movement of the big toe is down. Now I can exaggerate it for demonstration purposes, but why inflict more pain on a person? Except in this case, Paddy, sorry. So <laughs> I'm going to... Inflict a little bit more. Now, I'm, I'm sticking, and sticking, as Paddy will attest, this in quite firmly. So the toe's down now. I don't need to do any more. But Paddy's offered herself up in the sake of science. <laughs> Thank you. And you can see the toe can be made exaggeratedly down if you wish. But the first movement of the big toe is the key thing here. And there are other ways to do uh, the extensor, the plantar response beyond Babinski's sign. And you can run your hand down the tibial crest. You can squeeze the Achilles tendon tap the lateral malleolus, they're a little antiquated and not clinically useful in my view. So the plantar response is up along that border and the first movement of the big toe. If it's withdrawal, as in the patient's sore or tickly, start again. Um, if you're not sure, start again. It's very important to get this one right. 
Uh, I think it's one of the most important signs. Others, of course, disagree. Um, then you go to the opposite side, once again, and uh, on this time you stabilize the left leg. You start in the outer aspect once more. I'm sorry, Paddy. And the first movement of the big toe is now, and again to inflict more pain on Paddy, that the toe is progressively flexor. So that's a flexor, down-going, plantar response. Flexor, down-going, negative of Babinski, if you could avoid that, that'd be great. So a flexor plantar or an extensor is when that movement needs it to go up. Now I find a lot of medical students take their tendon hammers, um, don't stabilize the foot and do something like this. And then they say it's negative and run away. So you really need to have the strength of your convictions that you're doing this properly or don't bother. <laughs>